Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. And joining us now from Toronto, Canada, is Eric Margulies. He's a journalist who's covered Afghanistan, Kashmir, South Africa. He's uh, the author of the book, American Raj. You can find more about his work at ericmargulies.com. And he's an accomplished international correspondent. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Nice to be back, Paul. A recent article you wrote is called War is Sending the U.S. into Ruin. Why do you think so? Why is war sending the U.S. into ruin? President Obama said we desperately need to embark on austerity measures. He's formed a commission to cut spending. The U.S. is in effect bankrupt. Uh, it, o it owes about $1.5 trillion to China and Japan. It has almost 20% unemployment. I mean, it, it's on the skids. Uh, it is essential for the U.S. to cut spending. And the first place is the hugely bloated Pentagon and national security defense Well, well you, you say the first place, but clearly in Washington, it's the last place. Uh, it's untouchable. It is the biggest, the sacred cow. And even the American public uh, doesn't support this view. But, you know, you can't have guns and butter. And unfortunately, the current administration wants both. All right. Well, let's, let, me, let me cite some of the numbers you give in your article. In a budget that he's sending for 2011, a $3.8 trillion budget, the cost of the military is going to be close to a quarter of that, almost a trillion dollars. The military budget now includes spending like basic Pentagon budget of about $880 billion. It's estimated secret black programs that are not publicly on the Pentagon on pages, $70 billion, military aid to Egypt, Israel, and Colombia, military contractors, which are perhaps another 225,000, and it may even be higher than that, though it's not always clear how many there are, 16 intelligence agencies with over 200,000 people come in at about $75 billion, Afghan and Iraq wars, which have already cost about a trillion, running at about $200, $250 billion a year. The escalation in Afghanistan, another 30,000 troops could add another $33 billion. That's a lot of money that's a sacred cow. It certainly is. Uh, I mean, the United States spends half of the world's total uh, military spending. When you look, you add Russia and China, the only p possible uh, conceivable uh, adversaries in a in a war with the United States right now. India might be down the road at some point, but today uh, these two great powers, their defense spending adds up to peanuts compared to the United States. It's absolutely ludicrous. The United States uh, has 58 major bases abroad, a uh, quarter of a million troops. Uh, and perhaps as many as 700 to 1,000 bases in total abroad. That's right, large and small. Uh, but the U.S. is maintaining the same stat status posture that the British Empire did, which controlled 25 percent of the world's surface. Uh, but the U.S. can't afford this imperial stance anymore. And it's crazy. Against whom is the United States defending? Well, it used to be against the Soviets. Uh, now it's against the Muslims. Take away the Muslims and the Pentagon would have nothing to do. Well, so, if you read the Brzezinski's book, The, the Grand Chessboard, he gives an argument why all this is necessary. And essentially it is that without U.S. acting as the global policeman, if you will, the alternative is global anarchy. And he uses that phrase a lot, that the U.S. becomes this sort of arbiter of conflicts amongst countries, uh, that many, many elites in many countries only maintain you know, stability uh, with the knowledge that there's a U.S. base not too far away. Uh, what do you make of that argument? Because I think in both Republican and Democratic parties, that's the rationale, that, it's, that we stand between world disorder, and that's why we have to spend all this that's money. That's correct. I'm just reading a book published in the 1950s about the British Empire, British imperialism. It's very interesting, and he's citing 1886 or something like that in uh, uh, Afghanistan, then the Northwest frontier. And the British are saying exactly the same thing. They say, what happens if we withdraw our garrisons? There'll be anarchy. The tribes will fall under, who will e fall on each other. Who will defend Peshawar? The Soviet Union made the exact same argument about Eastern Europe and about the Caucasus. There is some truth to it, no doubt about it. But uh, I don't think America was created or is being run to be the worldwide master of the universe can't afford to do it anyway and it's it's not a very true argument because look at all the unrest that's going on in the world today with america as the sole 
uh, world power. In fact, I think there was greater stability when you had the Soviet Union around that had a bipolar world rather than the single world empire. Now that's something coming from Eric Margulis, who was reporting on the jihad with some enthusiasm in Afghanistan and, 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 and rather happy at the demise of the Soviet Union at the time. I was indeed, but uh, it has taken away a balance from the uh, international arena. I wish we'd had a more uh, benign, I don't know, nothing, nothing, very little good to say about the Soviet Union, except it was a bit like a big rock on the scale of world power. And the minute the Soviet Union collapsed, the, the U.S. became ultimately corrupted by ultimate power and uh, went on its own period of imperial Well, well let, me, let me give you expansion. a kind of counter argument you might hear from the Obama administration. Um, now, this is not any public reason why they're in Afghanistan, but if you talk to some people non-publicly, uh, they would say, we're very concerned about the unraveling of Pakistan, we're very concerned about tension between Pakistan and India, and one of the things that only the U.S. can do in Afghanistan is try to manage the situation in a way that there's, there's a kind of political structure, government that doesn't tilt too much towards India, but still ple and still pleases Pakistan, and only the Americans can do this. Well, excuse me for sounding cynical, but uh, at my age, I'm allowed to do that. The U.S. cannot manage affairs in Pakistan. It cannot manage, the U.S. government cannot manage affairs in incredibly complex Afghanistan. It can't even manage the U.S. Postal Office, which is losing money hand over stamps. Look at the great job Washington did in Iraq creating an unbelievable mess for which we're still paying. So this again is a specious imperialist argument uh, that has no water whatsoever. Now in the Democratic Party, the, the tradition that President Obama positioned himself as, whenever asked about where he is on foreign policy, he would always start with Truman and he would talk about being in the, in the traditional U.S. pragmatic foreign policy. He would go from Truman, he would even include Bush Sr. At times he'd include Reagan. What, what is this outlook of the world that, that sees this sort of democratic mission, which is shared by both parties? Uh, there's safety in number with uh, past presidents, for sure. And there is a strong internationalist, imperialist uh, impulse in the Democratic Party, as well as the Republican. It's not just as strong. But, uh, you know, come here, take, take Afghanistan. Uh, it, the United States, by entering the war in Afghanistan, has created the current mess in Pakistan and has turned the whole kind of 170 million Pakistanis against the United States. And now the U.S. is saying, well, if we withdraw, there'll be a mess in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We created it. The best way to end these messes, dangerous ones, is for the U.S. to withdraw. I think if Harry Truman had been president, he would have said, get your troops the hell out of there and let's shut down this war before we sink any deeper into the morass. Well, in the next segment of our interview, let's talk about the politics of taking on the military-industrial complex. Why is this enormous budget such a sacred cow? Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Eric Margulies on The Real News Network.